What I'd like to start off with is an observation, which is that if, if I've learned anything over the last year, it's that the, um, the supreme irony of publishing a book about slowness is that you have to go around promoting it really fast. I seem to spend most of my time these days you know, zipping from city to city, studio to studio, interview to interview, serving up the book in really tiny bite-sized chunks, because everyone these days wants to know how to slow down, but, but they want to know how to slow down really quickly. So, so I did a spot on CNN the other day where I actually spent more time in makeup than I did talking on air. And I think that, that that's not really surprising, though, is it? Because that's kind of the world that we, we live in now, a world stuck in fast-forward, a world obsessed with speed, with doing everything faster, with cramming more and more into less and less time. Every mo These days, even instant gratification takes too long. And if you think about how we try to make things better, what do we do? Well, we speed them up, don't we? So, you know, we used to dial, now we speed dial. We used to read, now we speed read. We used to walk, now we speed walk. And, of course, we used to date, and now we speed date. I mean, these are sort of the extreme examples, and they're, and they're amusing and good to laugh at. But there's a very serious point. And I think that in the headlong dash of daily life, we, we often lose sight of, of the damage that this roadrunner form of living does to us. We're so marinated in the culture of speed that we, that we almost fail to notice the toll it takes on every aspect of our lives, on our health, our diet, our work, our relationships, in the environment, and our community. And sometimes it, it takes a, a wake-up call, doesn't it, to, to alert us to the fact that we're hurrying through our lives instead of actually living them, that we're living the fast life instead of the, the good life. And I think for many people that wake-up call takes the form of an illness you know, uh, a burnout, or eventually the body says, I can't take it anymore, and throws in the towel. Or maybe a relationship goes up in smoke, because we haven't had the time, or the patience, or the tranquility to be with the other person, to listen to them. Now, my wake-up call came when I started reading bedtime stories to my son. And I found that at the end of the day, I would go into his room, and I just couldn't slow down. You know, I'd be speed-reading the cat in the hat. I'd be, you know, I'd be skipping lines here, paragraphs there, sometimes a whole page. And of course, my little boy knew the book inside out. So we would quarrel in what should have been the most relaxing, the most intimate, the most tender moment of the day when a dad sits down to read to his son became instead this kind of gladiatorial battle of wills, a clash between his speed and my, or my speed and his slowness. I wanted to investigate this whole roadrunner culture and what it was doing to me and to everyone else. And I, I had two questions in my head. The first was, how did we get so fast? And the second is, is it possible or, or even desirable to slow down? Now, if you think about how our world got so accelerated, the, the usual suspects rear their heads. You think of you know, urbanization, consumerism, the workplace, technology. But I think if you cut through uh, those forces, you get to what might be the, the deeper driver, the, the, the nub of the question, which is how we think about time itself. Now, in, in other cultures, time is, is cyclical. It's seen as moving in great, unhurried, circles. It's always re renewing and refreshing itself. Whereas in the West, time is linear. It's a finite resource. It's always draining away. You either use it or lose it. Time is money, as Benjamin Franklin said. And I think what that, that does to us psychologically is it, it creates an equation. Time is scarce, so what do we do? Well, well, we speed up, don't we? We try and do more and more with less and less time. We turn every moment of every day into a race to the finish line, a finish line, incidentally, that we never reach, but a finish line nonetheless. And I guess that the question is, uh, is it possible to break free from that mindset? And thankfully, the answer is yes, because what I discovered when I began looking around, that there is a, a global backlash against this culture that tells us that faster is always better and that busier is best. Right across the world, people are doing the unthinkable. They're slowing down and finding that, although conventional wisdom tells you that if you slow down your roadkill, the opposite turns out to be true, that by slowing down at the right moments, people find that they do everything better. They eat better, they make love better, they exercise better, they work better, they live better. And in this kind of cauldron of moments and places and acts of deceleration lie what a lot of people now refer to as the international slow movement. Now, if you'll permit me a small act of hypocrisy... I'll just give you a very quick overview of what, um, this, what's going on inside the slow movement. If you think of food, many of you will have heard of the slow food movement. It started in Italy, but has spread across the world and now has 100,000 members in 50 countries. And it's driven by a very simple and sensible message, which is that we get more pleasure 
and more health from our food when we cultivate, cook, and consume it at a reasonable pace. I think also the explosion of uh, the organic farming movement and the renaissance of farmer's market is another or other illustrations of the fact that people are desperate to get away from eating and cooking and cultivating their food on an industrial timetable. They want to get back to slower rhythms. And out of the slow food movement has grown something called the slow cities movement, which has started in Italy but has spread right across Europe and and, and beyond. And in this, towns begin to rethink how they organize the urban landscapes so that people are encouraged to to slow down and smell the roses and connect with one another. So they might curb traffic or put in a park bench or some green space. And in some ways, these changes add up to more than the sum of their parts, because I think when a slow city becomes officially a slow city, it's kind of like a philosophical declaration. It's saying to the rest of the world and to the people in that town that we believe that in the 21st century, slowness has a role to play.